we are going to talk about discourse communities. Quick definition of what a discourse community is. There's several different definitions, but they all overall cover similar ideas. First and foremost, a community in general is a group of people. You can't have one person be a community. A group of people have to be a community. So to be considered for a community, to be considered a discourse community, the members of that community have to share similar goals, values, genres, language, and expertise. There is a theorist called, his name is John Swales. He wrote an academic essay titled The Concept of Discourse Communities, and he theorized the idea of what a discourse community is. At the beginning of the essay, he really focuses on the word genre since this essay, the main audience, the primary audience, are individuals in composition writing. So he focuses on the word genre and uses his own definition that genres are texts recognizable to the reader and writer that meet the rhetorical situations they fall under, meaning genres are recognizable by their conventions. And again, a, fam a familiar list of what a genre is, all based on their own conventions. And I also added three writing genres that we are working on so far in this course. Your first essay was a narrative essay. It had specific conventions of having a lot of detail and creative writing about an individual. Your second paper that you worked on was an analytical essay, so very, very different from the narrative essay, not as much creative writing based, not as much use of tone. You're keeping all your ideas focused on one genre to analyze. And then a research essay that we're moving into is very neutral. It's not an argument piece. It's um, you writing a paper about a community issue that should be neutral, unbiased, and based on sources. Of course, we're not quite into the research essay yet, but just so you understand the difference between the writing genre, some of the writing genres in this course, and the overall list of genres that are recognizable based on their conventions. So first, before I get into John Swale's theory of discourse communities, I want to explain what a theory is specifically in a writing course. A theory is an idea that is tested. Someone puts forth an idea, they are theorizing, they're discussing this idea, and they apply it to something. So when a writer theorizes, they are applying a theory to add discussion to a topic. They're adding new discussion to a topic. When you theorize in this course, you are applying new information to determine its outcome. The essay that we are working on this week is the Discourse Community Ethnography. For that essay, you are applying a theory of discourse communities to any community of your choice to determine if it should be considered a discourse community or not. So you're theorizing, you're putting an idea that already exists, an existing theory, to something that you're interested in to critically analyze a community that you are either a member of or that you hope to become a member of. So John Swales suggested that in order for a community to be considered a discourse community, it has to meet these six characteristics. All six, it can't be missing one. It has to meet all six characteristics to be considered a discourse community. So I'm gonna go into each one of these in the following slides. And again, Swales is a theorist. He argues that a community is not a discourse community unless it meets all of the six characteristics that were just listed. So let's discuss each of those characteristics in detail so that you can start beginning to think about what community you're a member of or that you want to be a member of to determine if it might meet Swales' criteria or not. So he, he writes, his language is very, very, very technical. So if you get a little confused with the heading here and the certain, he uses a lot of jargon in which we don't like. We want to make sure we're clear on each characteristics. So the bullet points will help and this informant, this word that's highlighted in red, that's the main focus of the characteristic. So number one, he said his first characteristic, he said a discourse community has a broadly agreed set of common public goals. So basically number one, is 
what does the community hope to accomplish? What goals do members share that they hope to accomplish? The members have to have one common objective or more, not separate. So it's not considered a discourse community if each member has separate goals. It has to be at least one goal that they are working on together to accomplish. Everyone is reaching for that same goal. So that's the first characteristic. His second characteristic is that a discourse community has mechanisms of intercommunication amongst its members. So just focus on that word intercommunication. And what he means by that is what forms of communication do the members use to talk to each other? How do members speak to each other in that, when they are in that community? Do they hold meetings, telecommunications? Do they have correspondence? Do they use newsletters? Or the very last bullet point is probably the most common. It might be all of these or some. Last bullet point is most common. Do, they, do members verbally speak to each other? What I mean by verbal communication is using words to speak to one another. Do they also use nonverbal? Nonverbal communication is an excellent form of conversation style too. Nonverbal communication can be eye contact, it could be hand gestures, it could be sign language, it could be the use of emojis. Anything that's not spoken is nonverbal. So how do members speak to one another? Number three, a discourse community uses its participatory mechanisms primarily to provide information and feedback. Again, like I said, he uses a lot of jargon. So number three, just feedback. Focus on that word feedback. And what they mean by that is how are members accomplishing what they hoped to accomplish? How do they evaluate this? Do they have surveys? Do they have meetings? If it's a classroom community, grades, observations, evaluations. What I mean by number three is go back to what you wrote for goals and ask yourself, how do members know that they are reaching that goal or not? What feedback is given to them? That's what he means by number three mainly. Number four, a discourse community utilizes and hence possesses one or more genres in the communicative Furtherance of its aims. Ugh, a lot, right? So number four, what genres are used in this community? Do they use physical documents? Do they use websites, text messages, papers, emails? What genre, what medium, what communication medium is used between members? Number five, in addition to owning genres, a discourse community has acquired some specific lexis. Lexis is a fancy word for language. What are examples of language that make this community distinctive from another? Meaning, if you heard certain words, what indicates that you are in that community? And we'll see some examples right now that might give something away. But if I said the word touchdown, what community comes to mind? Football, right? So that's an example of Lexus used in that community that makes it very distinctive to that community only. Abbreviations, terminology, anything that indicates certain language that's distinctive to members of that community. If I say the word rhetoric, you're probably thinking of this class versus your math class. It's specific language distinctive to us. Number six, a discourse community has a threshold level of members with a suitable degree of relevant content and discoursal expertise. Is there an even status of membership or hierarchy? How is that decided? Meaning, are all members equal in status of that community? Or are there different levels of achievement? For example, novice versus experts in a video game community? levels of advancement, maybe in more of a job setting, maybe a, an entry level position is different than somebody who's been there a few years, than a manager, than a corporate position, so on and so forth. But that's not just that. Even if members are equal, what knowledge does each member bring that's unique to the other members? That's all examples of the different status of expertise for number six. So a community is not considered a discourse community unless it meets all six of these criteria. So if you want to download this PowerPoint, you can. I have a quick YouTube video that I want you to look at. So go ahead and pause the video, watch the scene, and we'll talk about applying 
the theory to a specific community. All right, so that scene alluded to a community, a specific community, and we are going to pretend we are members of that community. So we are going to pretend we are members of the Starbucks community. We're going to, we are going to pretend that we work there. If anybody works there, awesome. Maybe you could point out some things that I'm missing on the examples as well. So looking at the first characteristic about a discourse community, members having and sharing common goals, as employees of Starbucks, what common goals do you think we share? And again, feel free to pause the video and answer to kind of compare your answers to what we have on this, what I have on the PowerPoint. So we want to make profit. We want to sell good drinks and food. And we want to have, I shouldn't say make, but we hope customers will come back. Uh, maybe just as, as well, we just want to make money. We want to earn a paycheck. So we found at least one example for common goals. So we can put a check mark and it meets the first characteristic of swales. Second characteristics, how do members communicate? What is the inner communication used? What type of communication takes place at Starbucks? Verbal, employees speak directly to customers and to themselves. Nonverbal is also used, uh, maybe if it's really crowded and one employee is on one side of the room, the other employee is on the other side of the room, they make eye contact instead of yelling across the room so they don't look unprofessional, so that nonverbal cue, um, any type of nonverbal communication is used at Starbucks. They have those headsets that they wear to communicate with the people in the drive-thru and then nowadays especially more than ever now they have digital orders so they communicate customers communicate their orders through the app and website as well so we definitely found at least one example for intercommunication so it meets characteristic number two third characteristic how thinking about the goals that we had We've talked about they want to make money, they want to make the best coffee, they want to have customers come back, they want to get a paycheck. So how do we know that we are reaching those goals? What feedback is given so we know we are meet, we are reaching each of those goals? Well, maybe they have meetings, I believe. You know, they have, I don't know how often, but weekly, monthly, however, every two weeks or maybe every pay period in general, they have staff meetings to discuss any kind of problems going on. They take inventory to see the sales, compare sales to the week before, the month before, the year before. Online reviews, Facebook, Yelp, Google in general, about especially maybe which Starbucks in town is the best or and worst. The tip jar, they have tip jars, so hopefully if customers are being nice, <laughs> they are leaving tips, and that's a good that's good feedback too. Plus anything else, so we definitely found at least one example there, so we can put a check mark. For characteristic number three, so we're halfway. We're halfway in determining if this is a discourse community or just a community. And remember, it's a discourse community if it meets all six. So number four, what genres are used at Starbucks? The logo could count as a genre. It's an object identifier. It's a flyer in a way, kind of a poster type genre. So it's recognizable based on its conventions. The menu is definitely a genre because it's specific to Starbucks only. The drinks with the names on them, you know, Starbucks jokingly is known for misspelling names, so that's almost its own secret genre too. They have a website, nowadays I would just call it an app, for customers to visit online and even take and place orders on. Their receipts, every store has their own receipt, has their name on it, so that's a genre used between members and customers. I put songs because if you, you know a little bit back in my day more the coffee shops were known for music for having maybe even albums that you could buy that were coffee shop soundtracks you know or something like that so a type of song that's related to Starbucks could be a genre in a way too. Regardless we found more than one example for genre so it meets characteristic number four. Lexus. Lexus is a perfect example for Starbucks as we noticed in the video at the beginning of this lecture. When you think of Starbucks, what are common words, phrases, sentences that make you realize, that helps you know you're there? 
Well, the drink sizes, tall, grande, venti, trenta. The drink types, especially the silly ones like the unicorn frappe, London fog, drip, dirty chai. Uh, they asked me recently if I, they said, they asked me, do you want room? And I had to pause on what they meant, meaning do I, that, do I want them to leave room in my coffee cup so I can add cream, sugar, and everything else? So that's a, that's a good phrase that they use. They have a mission statement. A mission statement is a sentence or more that describes the goals of, a, of an organization, and it's specific to that organization. So this is their mission statement. I'm not sure if it changed. Sometimes mission statements get updated more and more. But regardless, this is their mission statement. This link shows all their different secret menu items that are all examples of language meaning Lexus. So definitely meets that characteristic. Are all members equal in work status or are there various levels of expertise? You definitely have to work your way up and the more experience you have, the longer you stay, the more expertise you gain anyways, even if you don't plan on becoming a manager, a regional manager, or moving to corporate. But regardless, there's there's steps you can take if you want to move up within the company. Since especially it's not a local business, but even in a local business, there are ways to m move up in rank or status or just overall knowledge. So we definitely have different levels of expertise in this community. So that was our sixth one, sixth characteristic. So we Starbucks is considered a discourse community because we were able to find examples for all six characteristics of John Swale's theory. So that's applying theory to a community to determine the outcome. The outcome being if it's a discourse community or just a community. So why do we do this? The point. Applying Swale's six characteristics of a discourse community allows you just to understand what a theory is. It allows you to write about a community you're a part of or not a part of and lets you explore outside the classroom and allows you to bring that into the classroom atmosphere. Writing about a community, again, you're a part of or not a part of, maybe even more so if you're not a part of because you're placing yourself in the rhetorical situation. You're placing yourself like we just did right now, pretending, unless you work at Starbucks, awesome, that, that was probably easier for you, hopefully, but you're placing yourself in a community that you don't know about and you're analyzing that community to understand it better. And it fully helps you build ethos, your credibility as a researcher, writer, and overall communicator, critically analyzing information. Building ethos helps you understand, maybe try to solve and debate potential issues that community faces, getting that critical lens in on the community.